Hey everybody, welcome to the PC Perspective Mailbag, where we answer your questions that you send in, not through real, real mail and not through email, but instead from comments. So it should be the comment bag, but that doesn't really in, emote the same type of thing. So if you have questions for us, this is where we answer your questions, regardless of their form in which they're submitted. If you can leave them on uh, this YouTube video here or on the post on PCPro.com that that includes this video, then we will look at those questions, pick some out for next week's episode. Uh, let's go ahead and jump into what we have today. Uh, this is, by the way, episode 53. It's July 20th, in case you don't in case you don't know. Well, it's July 20th as I record this. Jumping into it. Western Gents United asks a question. Do you think Intel will put some proprietary system on its motherboards that will enhance the Intel graphics cards when they come out? like some sort of crosstalk or performance enhancing feature that only works with Intel GPUs. Um, mm, 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 I, I don't want to say no, but the, the idea here is, is that would Intel take advantage of the fact that uh, their chipsets and their graphics cards and their processors would all be on the same platform and would they um, uh, in, include some kind of performance enhancement? I would say... In general, that's a pretty complex thing to do. If they're going to do discrete graphics cards for gaming, they're going to interface through the PCI Express bus that we all know and love. Um, Intel could, in theory, do things to accelerate that That if, the, if they wanted, right? They could um, change and overclock the PCI Express uh, interface if they recognize the processor, the the platform, and the GPU at work, right? Because they've they've seen what it can do, they know what it can validate it, uh, that it can be validated, that type of thing. Um, I'm not really sure how beneficial that would be. You know, talking to system memory more quickly could be something that it would do. Uh, but in general, you're still going through Windows. You're still going through the driver stack. And that kind of limits a lot of what you can do with super magic extra stuff. Um, AMD is a pretty smart company. They don't have quite the R&D budget that Intel does. But if this were possible, we would have seen probably some performance improvements when pairing a Radeon graphics card with a Ryzen platform or even an AMD processor before that. And we never really did. Um, the only advantage that AMD had from having CPU and GPU inside the same company was that they got to build APUs and they were able to create kind of a unique platform in that regard. So no, I don't think they're going to do any performance enhancing features with uh, Intel GPUs, but I would be glad to be wrong in that case because any advantage you can get that actually turns into better performance and stuff like that for, for gamers, I think is a plus. Uh, we have a second question from Western Gents United who asks, why don't they make a laptop that combines both Snapdragon and Intel CPUs? The Snapdragon would be activated for low-level day-to-day tasks, while the Intel CPU firing up when you need the performance. It seems this would give the best of both worlds, sort of like how discrete integrated GPUs work in some laptops. You're here with the big ideas and the big questions this week. Um, so in, in base theory level, yes, that's a pretty good idea. And actually, this is what ARM already does, sort of, with its big little infrastructure. Qualcomm, a lot of Android guys do this. Um, iOS uh, does this with their with their processors where they have big cores and they have little cores. Essentially that the little cores operate for the more mundane background tasks, low performance requirements, and then only when needed do the big GP or the big CPUs spin up and uh, handle those tasks. Now the capability is built in a way that they're on the same die. They share the same memory controller. They often share the same cache. Uh, when you need to move all of the data from one pipeline to another, like a, it, the operating system determines that this task is going to be a low, uh, low importance, low performance task to a high performance task, then it needs to move all that data over. That's easy to do on. Uh, it's it's easier. It's accomplishable on a die. Whereas if you had a uh, a notebook with just a motherboard on it that had an Intel processor and a Snapdragon processor, that's almost that's basically impossible to unfeasible for somebody to actually do. Especially an OEM. Like no OEM is going to do that. This would require the partnership of you know Qualcomm and Intel to really do that. Um, and that's just 
one, from a business perspective, they're not going to do that. And, and two, it's just a really, really, really difficult thing. If anything, what you would maybe see happen instead is maybe Intel uh, does a little bit more work and they develop their own core kind of comparable to an ARM, Qualcomm, Snapdragon design, and they do that big little with their parts. Uh, it's possible that we see ARM uh, or Apple do this when they move to their own processors on notebooks, which has been long rumored. If they do that, I expect them to have high performance cores and lower performance, low power cores. But in terms of integrating this from today's perspective with today's technology and getting a Snapdragon and, a, and an Intel Core Series processor, it's just not something that's business-wise feasible or really technically feasible in, uh, in the current environments. But it's a good idea. That idea has been applied to mobile devices already. And actually, if you look at, um, I don't have one here with me, but if you look at the Qualcomm Snapdragon uh, Windows PCs, they, they are doing this as well. They have their quad core, too big, too little. And the you can see all four of those cores working in Task Manager and, and how they are trading information back and forth and, and how the applications will move from one to the other. So it is trying to do the best of both worlds. But I agree with what you're – in an ideal situation, we'd have you know, mobile cores all the way up to desktop class cores all in a notebook. And it would scale across maybe five different core types uh, at different frequency levels and performance levels in order to uh, really give us the best – battery life with the best performance and then the balances in between. Next question, Till Overhill says, I'm going to use link aggregation to combine my motherboard's two gigabit Ethernet ports for load balancing on my network, but I'd like to be able to monitor each interface individually to analyze traffic and usage patterns. I can monitor the overall aggregated connection, but I but do you know of a way to monitor each interface separately in Windows 10? P.S. I'd love to see more discussion on the site and podcast about link aggregation in home networks. So uh, I'm not the right person to answer this question, so I went to our IT guys, the guys who deal with this and more commercial environments as well. And uh, the general consensus is this isn't something that's that's really possible. You would really need some kind of a managed switch in order to monitor the I.O. for those individual ports. Um, Jeremy suggests that if you were really, really good at configuring Wireshark, you might be able to do that, but you would be taking a performance penalty in order to monitor um that closely to figure out like packet source and stuff. Um, I agree with those assessments. I don't have anything to really counter that. I don't know of any alternatives for that. Um, I understand and appreciate the value of the aggregated connection, but you do lose a, a little bit in the in the process of uh, of doing that. So. Sorry, I don't have a better answer for you, but uh, if anybody else has thoughts or they've done something like this and they want to share it with us, leave it in the comments and we'll see it for next week's episode and we'll, uh, we'll give you guys an update. Question from Robert Galloway. How is Apple able to use DDR3 with the 7th and 8th generation Intel CPUs in the new MacBook Pro? And he has a quote here of the 2018 13-inch continues to use LPDDR3 while the 15-inch, the new 15-inch model moves to LPDDR3. Um, I mean, the reason they can do this is that the Intel processor supports both of those memory interfaces. Now, what you're probably confused by is that the 7th and 8th generation from a uh, consumer product, desktop product, has only ever, really, they only talk about DDR4 support. Uh, because DDR4 memory is not significantly more expensive than DDR3, uh, it is definitely higher performance in a, in a desktop class system where you care about that. But when it comes to uh, the performance uh, or, or power consumption of mobile devices, a lot of times OEMs are willing to trade the added performance of DDR4 over DDR3 for the lower power consumption, lower power draw of the slower, older technologies. And that's what they're doing here uh, with Apple in these, in these two MacBooks. So LPDDR3, you know, it's a little bit of a performance deficit, but not dramatically so. And again, system memory is... Still more about capacity than, than speed, uh, more about memory channels than about frequency, although there are, are uh, places where that's not the case, applications where that's not the case. And then if you look at Ryzen, there are platforms where that's not the case. But with Intel processors, it's, it's more, more the case than not. Um, so that's, that's how they can do it and how they're able to, to move back and forth between those two depending on uh, their other demands. 
Kristen Rich asks, Gisco claims that its Flare X DDR4 memory is, quote, specifically tuned for Ryzen. How does it differ from other products with the same specs? For example, they offer a 2x8 gig kit at 3200 megahertz uh, CAS 14 in the Flare X, Trident Z RGB, and Ripjaws 5 product lines. Are the Flare X, quote, tuning claims all just marketing and RGBs? Uh, there, the yes, the majority of the of of that tuning would be there, uh, kind of a marketing push. The there is some legitimacy to the idea that you can include the the right specifications um, for the right platform, and that they have the timings embedded in them for uh, uh, Intel or AMD's memory acceleration technologies, right? When you go to the BIOS and you can enable it and all these motherboard guys call it slightly different things where you can auto enable the overclocked settings for it. You can have memory that has, that is better, better, I don't want to say tuned, but is better configured for the Intel variant and better configured for the AMD variant. That's where some of that comes into play. But fundamentally, if you look at the frequencies and the timings, they're not doing different things for different, uh, different platforms on that. So yes, there is a lot of uh, marketing and RGB and what kind of heat sink do you like. And, um, but I do think there, there's, there's value in um, validated memory. In other words, this class of this, this brand of memory is validated on the AMD parts and this one is validated on the Intel parts. And if they're actually doing that work and you're building a Ryzen system and you want to make sure everything is working 100% out of the box, then buy that memory if it's not significantly more expensive. But if you do buy the Intel, quote unquote, Intel branded memory, um, it should still work on your system, all else being equal uh, in, in most cases. So, yes. Question from Gary Mitchell. Asks, in a triple monitor setup, how would a system handle using two different GPUs from the same manufacturer but with different specs at the same time? Can you use a high-end GPU for gaming while having a lower-end GPU to handle everything else? So first question, um, how was how would a system, Windows 10 system, handle using two different GPUs from the same manufacturer at the same time? They do that fairly well. Uh, we've That's not a, not a problem anymore. And in fact, if you wanted to have an AMD and an NVIDIA card in there in a Windows 10 system, you can do that. It's a little bit more chance of things getting wonky and screwy, uh, but y- you you can still do that. You can install an NVIDIA driver and an AMD driver, and the Windows 10 is kind of, I think, since basically since Windows 7 or maybe it was Windows 8, That's that's been a part of, uh, of functionality of Windows. So yeah, you can do that and you can have multiple, you know, different monitors hooked up to the different graphics cards. In terms of can you use a high-end GPU for gaming while having a lower-end GPU handle everything else? Yes, you can do that as well. Um, that you would want to I probably still don't need to do it, but I would still recommend having the same manufacturer um, because you can actually go into it and in the NVIDIA control panel, for example, you could, you know what, I haven't checked on this in a while. I assume PhysX is still a thing. In the control panel, you could select which GPU to use PhysX. And a lot of people, I know Mori did this for a while, you have a high-end GPU, you'd upgrade to a new high-end GPU. Your previous high-end GPU or mid-range GPU, you leave in this system and you tell the uh, control panel, hey, all my PhysX processing do on this. That allows you to, to kind of get some stuff out of that older GPU that's still in there while um, you know still putting all the rendering on, on one, uh, on your higher-end one. So yes, you can do that. I'm not saying it's not without a little bit of risk of hiccups and crashes and all that type of stuff, uh, but uh, it's it's definitely doable. Next question in from Kali. As a follow-up to my backplate question last week, which was uh, featured in the uh, great title that we had of last week's mailbag, if I decide that I prefer the look of the exposed PCB, is it safe to remove the backplate on a GPU that ships with one? Specifically, it's a Gigabyte Aorus RX 588 gigabyte. Um, I would say yes, as long as there's no, if, if there's no memory on the back of the video card, then yes, you're fine. Um, the RS, the RX 580 is not a particularly long or heavy graphics card, so you don't have to worry about any of the flexing there. You're not shipping the system. This is for your own, uh, in your own PC at home. Um, yes, I would have no qualms against removing the back plate, uh, as long as there's, 
not things that it's cooling on the back. And even if there is, even if there there are memory chips on the back and that heat plate maybe had um, some thermal pads on them or whatever, yeah, you might be safe doing it, right? So um, if you have good airflow across the back of the video card, which you probably should if you have a standard case design with airflow from front to back. So uh, yeah, I would, if you decide you don't like it and you want to take it off, Take it off. I don't think you're going to cause any permanent damage. Even if if something were to become unstable, you can just you can put it back on there. So just be careful when you remove uh, any components from your graphics card like that. Next question comes in from Ravo K. Could GDDR5 be used as system memory instead of DDR4 since it's much faster? Um, this question comes around a lot. Um, and despite the fact that it just has a G prefix on it, the GDDR memory is actually fairly differently designed than DDR. Uh, GDDR memory is specifically designed for sequential requests, I guess, uh, more attuned to the highly parallelizable, highly parallel workloads of GPUs, whereas DDR memory is more tuned for multi-step functions per multiple uh, data moves per instruction, right? So um, even though it seems a little bit odd to think that, hey, CPUs tend to be the serial processors um, and thus the serialized memory of GDDR would make more sense. It's actually the DDR4 memory, DDR in, in general, 3, 4, whatever, uh, is kind of better tuned for the out of order operations that a CPU needs to uh, better handle serial processing. Whereas the GDDR5 is going to be a lower power but wider bus, um, straight line speed type of thing, if that makes any sense. So, I mean, in theory, you could do it, but they're optimized that way for a reason. If, um, if Intel or AMD thought on their CPU that using GDDR4 or even GDDR5 would give them the huge bandwidth improvements that, you know, the GPUs claim that they have, they would do that. I mean, you know, Intel especially would be able to kind of push the market, hey, we're going to make modules of GDDR4, GDDR5, um, but that's just that's just not what they're optimized for. There's a, there's a reason why the G exists there, there's a reason why it's a different design and why it's a different implementation for it. Different memories, different use cases, there you have it. Uh, let's see. DBS7 asks, do current desktop motherboards and chipsets support DisplayPort over USB-C? It seems to be a requirement for the new virtual link spec, but I only see it discussed in terms of laptops, never desktop motherboard reviews. Um, that's probably because a lo most of the motherboards that you're seeing reviewed or that we look at are really focused on the enthusiast side where there are discrete GPUs, and so using the integrated graphics on the processor isn't really a focus. Yes, you can, um, I, I can't tell you for sure a motherboard that I have seen or used here that supports display output over USB. Yeah, we, no, we definitely have had that, um, display output over USB-C. Um, the requirement for virtual link is is in there, right? And it uses the Type C port, and it's an alternate mode of uh, of USB Type C, so it has some different modifications to it. And the laptop discussion is a little bit different because because of the the level of integration that you get on a notebook, where uh, you know the the OEM knows what the graphics card is, or what the the few options they can be, what the CPU is, what the display is, what the what the interface between the display and the dis and the graphics portion is going to be um so that that makes it a little bit easier from a from a standpoint of kind of designing that system you know what everything's going to be um there are motherboards and uh, out there that will support display output through usb type c um but it just hasn't been a focus of what we've really looked at yet but uh it's something to i will pay more attention to that going forward and seeing which motherboards actually support that um I would say in regards to virtual link, it probably won't matter much because you're not going to be using integrated graphics for your VR gaming. And instead, we'll see what discrete graphics card come out, discrete graphics cards come out with virtual link support and uh, what that will mean for that. And in which case, you know, 
that will already have been discussed and handled uh, by NVIDIA and AMD in that regard. Um, last question, the big man says, Ryan, does your last name have anything to do with the name they give the plastics on components and parts? Shrouds, S-H-R-O-U-D-S. Uh, I don't think so. I don't. I don't believe. I don't believe that's the case. So, I mean, if it is, maybe I can sue them for some rights and stuff for for use of my name. But as far as I'm concerned, I don't. I don't think there's any overlap there. Uh, but. Thanks for looking out for me. I do appreciate it. Again, if you guys have questions for us for next week's episode uh, and or anything going forward in the future, make sure you leave them on the YouTube video that you're watching here today, and we will check them for questions for next week. Same goes for on PCPer.com. If you leave a comment on that news post that is associated with this video, we will look there as well. And uh, let's see. Next week, I probably won't be on it. It'll be Alan or Josh covering it. Um, so tailor your questions accordingly. Thanks everyone. See you next time. Mm -hmm.